every time someone wanted me to write an essay, all I wanted to do was paint a picture. I deviated a lot. Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, and I'm founder and editor-in-chief of Design, the online architecture and design magazine. And this is our face-to-face -face podcast series in which I sit down with some of the world's leading architects and designers and talk about what they do, how they got there, and how they started out. In this episode, I speak to the incredible Ez Devlin. She started out as a theatre designer, but then became world famous for the sets she designed for leading artists including Beyonce, Kanye West and U2. But as I found out in the interview, her earliest creative projects involved making obstacle courses for her guinea pigs using chopped up cardboard boxes. Ez studied literature, but was a rebellious student, choosing to paint pictures instead of writing essays. When she later moved into theatre design, she admits that she would disregard the stage directions and do her own thing. The interview took place in her home and studio in South London. Downstairs in the studio, her team were busy working on some fantastic project for somewhere in the world, so we did the interview upstairs in her bedroom. I've known Ez for a few years and she really is one of the most amazing, electrifying people to speak to. She peppers her dialogue with references to art, science, movies, culture, theatre, literature, and quite often the references go over my head and I have to sit there nodding as if I've read that book or seen that play. Anyway, you'll hear all this for yourself as you listen to the interview with the incredible, maverick, fantastic Ez Devlin. This podcast is sponsored by Twinmotion, the real-time architectural visualization solution for creating stunning visuals and immersive experiences in seconds. Learn more at twinmotion.com. Hi, Ez. Hi, Marcus. Could you just describe yourself? Who are you and what do you do? I'm a designer artist director who works across a range of fields, quite a wide range of fields, including large-scale architectural works, gallery installations, and theatre, opera, and concerts. And you describe yourself as a designer or an artist, or what's your best, your favourite creative title for yourself? Actually, at the moment, I'm calling myself an artist, designer, director. And if you could just explain where we are, it's quite an unusual setup you have here. Well, my studio is in my house in South East London, and my studio is quite busy today. So we have taken refuge upstairs in my bedroom. And describe your studio, because I walked in there earlier and there were two giant hands there and all kinds of other things. There's models all over the place. Describe the, the setup and describe your working environment. So we're in an Edwardian house on a street in South East London. And the front part of the house is a series of Edwardian living rooms that have been knocked together to form a series of workspaces which are lined with books, models, relics of previous projects. There's a giant pair of hands that are left over from a Carmen opera that we did on the lake in Bregenz. There are lots of models of Abel Tesfe from the weekend's head lying around. Um, we rather like being surrounded. There are eight of us in there, designers, and we rather like being surrounded by a little memory palace of works that we've touched on before. A lot of your work is, is ephemeral, isn't it? It's a, it's a stage set. It's something that you build and then gets taken away. So I guess these are little mementos, are they, from things that don't exist anymore? Well, yes. I mean, lately, of course, I've realised that everything I've been saying about the ephemerality of my work is utter crap because it leaves the most massive carbon footprint. So it's just the little bits of ephemera in my studio and a huge shitload of carbon in the atmosphere, unfortunately. We'll come back to your working process later, but just, just to give everyone an idea of the scale of these hands that I was talking about, they're, what, I don't know, three metres high or something Indeed. like that? Indeed. The ones that are in my studio are three metres high, and they were the small-scale model of the ones that emerged out of Lake Constance, which were 29 metres high. Let's take it back to the beginning. Tell us about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? What did your family do? What were your earliest memories, and how was your early life? I'm fundamentally a child of... 1970s slash 80s suburbia. I was born in Kingston upon Thames and that's where I spent the first six years of my life and my mother was a teacher of English and my dad was a journalist, an education journalist on the Times and they went for a romantic weekend in the small village of Rye, the small town of Rye in Sussex and they came back having changed their life and we moved there in 1977 and that changed everything for us because we then grew up more or less on the beach. We went to Canberra Sands after school pretty much every day or Winchelsea Beach. And it was a much more feral, much wilder upbringing 
Um, we went to Beckley Woods. We picked, you know, picked things in the forest. We foraged. So, so that changed everything really in my childhood. And there was such a mythology around that town. Rye had a way of telling its stories. They had, you know, a little model that lit up and told its own town stories. So, storytelling in architecture and the countryside became very much linked in my mind. So you were a child living in this kind of cute little seaside town with this, um, these expanses of beach and forest and, right. and marsh around you. So but did you at that time realise that uh, you had a creative streak? Did you, were you in the woods making tree houses or weaving reeds or anything like that? We were making a lot of stuff, yes, because there wasn't right lot else to do. We are refrain. I was one of four children. I am one of four children. And... Our constant refrain was, we're bored, I'm bored, what should we do? And our parents always said, well, if you're bored, it's because you're boring. And we didn't want to be boring. So we found something to do. And it was mainly using, you know, Kellogg's cornflakes packets or toilet rolls or making runs for the gerbils or making, you know, obstacle courses for the guinea pigs. We spent a lot of time on our hands and knees on the floor making stuff. I actually think I developed a little kind of flatness in my chin because I used to rest my chin on my knee when I was concentrating, cutting things up on the floor. And we, Rye has quite a, um, a sort of pagan tradition of bonfire night, Guy Fawkes. And we would always make a guy, you know, we would make that up. And then Halloween was a big time for making things, cutting up masks and costumes. So there was quite a lot of theatre just in the sort of ritual available in that, in that town anyway. And my parents made stuff. My parents, you know, my dad, my dad crochets. My mum paints. They, they're, they're both very uh, hand, hands-on creative people. And did you find that you were good at that? Were your masks better than all the other kids' masks? I was a really hard worker. You know, I just, I was diligent. I would just spend hours and hours and hours on it. Hours and hours. I was slow and diligent. And yeah, I think I probably in that sort of Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing, I, I clocked up a lot of hours. So what were the next step then? How did that start to become a career? Did you, you went to art school, didn't you? Yeah, well, we moved from Rye, um, largely because of the schools, actually. Oddly, Stella McCartney, the, the McCartneys lived there and they all went to the local school. But my mum and dad didn't, didn't want us to go there. Um, so we moved to Cranbrook in Kent, which ha has a really nice school um, that you can go to for free. So we went there. It's one of those, you know, grammar schools that probably shouldn't exist, to be honest, but it was a really nice school. So all four of us went there and they had a great art department. And at the time, it was around the resurgence of land art. So there was Richard Long, um, there was Goldsworthy. We were really, our art teacher, um, Chris Thomas, was really into uh, the land art movement. So he would take us into Bedgebury Pinetum and we would make a shelter and sleep in it and then spend the days making sculptures in the forest. So that was sort of my way into, I guess, you know, sculpture, environmental sculpture a bit. I didn't take the course of going to art school straight from school, and largely because it was a really practical point in that period, sort of 1989 or wherever it was. If you went to art school, you stayed living at home. So I would have gone to Maidstone Art School and I lived at home and all I wanted to do was do that thing of going away to university. I wanted to leave home. So I decided instead to study literature. And I went to Bristol University and read for three for three years, which I, I'm really glad I did now because I would never have had time again in my life to sit for three years and just read. And during that period, were you still being creative? Was it all channeled through writing? No, of course, every time someone wanted me to write an essay, all I wanted to do was paint a picture. So I spent a lot of time, I painted the floor of my house, I made stained glass windows, I was, yeah, I was busy making stuff, I, I got involved in the theatre there, so yeah, I deviated a lot from, from the course. And, I, and also the things I was writing, the literature that attracted me was uh, very concrete imagery, so I would always find the concrete imagery, the, you know, the, the thing that was very uh, imagistic in the writing. And at that point, were you making a connection between literature and three-dimensional space was was the theatre you mentioned that you you went to the theatre but was that something that you were already experimenting with how could you realize your ideas in relationship to to plays or did that come later oddly enough my my connection to theatre at Bristol University was that I directed a piece um Joe Orton biography called Diary of a Somebody by Bert La largely again the reason I chose that piece to direct was because Joe Orton famously used to go to the library 
and steel pages and cut them out and made this massive collage on his wall. And I was drawn to that play because of that piece of imagery. I wanted to make that collage. So I said, well, I'll direct the play so that I can make that collage. So that was really the theatre connection at that point. I wasn't specifically thinking of translating from text to image directly, but I think I was building towards it subconsciously. So you directed the play. Did you also design the set or did mm-hmm. you get someone else to do that? No, we, we did. Every, I mean, my friend Becky Hardy, who's now Margaret Atwood's editor, actually, one of my dearest old friends, she, um, she and I did it together and we just sort of directed it, designed it and generally cried in the corner and uh, did, did our best. And what happened after that then? after you finished at Bristol? Well, then, of course, I wanted to go to art school. You know, I had no clear concept of a job, and I was privileged enough to... I had a a boyfriend who was quite a bit older than me. He was paying the rent, so I didn't have to get a job. I was lucky. So I went back, and I went to St Martin's and did the foundation course then, after I'd done the degree. And I loved that. That was such a great year. So tell us about that time then. Oh, God, can you imagine? I was 21, everyone else was 18... I had no interest in going out and hanging out with 18-year-olds. I just I was like the little swat in the corner. <laughs> I was just working, working, working. A mature student. Almost. I was a mature student. I was. There was another one as well. We got on great. Uh, actually, I got on with quite a lot of them. They're really interesting people. And, yeah, can you imagine suddenly having been in a library for three years? That foundation course at, at St. Martin's was... You know, a week in the darkroom doing photography, a week in the fashion studio, a week in the theatre studio, a week in the sculpture room. You know, it was like being, it was like Christmas. It was, it was really rich education. And what was that era in London going on in music and culture? Well, that was it. I think it was around 93, because so often when I refer back to pieces of theatre and music that I saw, it was in that year, because I went out almost every night. So it was all of the Pina Bausch was here, Robert Wilson was here, Robert Lepage was here. You know, there was a load of stuff going on at the South Bank, tons of stuff going on at the Haywood. It was rich, rich, rich. Well, it was for me. I guess London's always rich. I just, it was a period where I went to things rather than missed things. It's had a big influence, that period. So you were very much involved in, in literary culture then rather than the pop scene because there was also a lot of music going on around that time well actually the guy I was going out with Clive Martin is a a record producer so we would go to gigs a lot um, but his special area of interest was live bands so it was just that period where the live vocal the live band the live instrumentation the guitars were beginning to resurge having been overwhelmed in the 80s somewhat by electronica so we would go and see an awful lot of live, live, live. It was, the, I guess it was around the time of Brit pop as well. It was all that pulp and blur and all that stuff. I was going to mention pop because that, that song yeah. about, you know, she studied uh, sculpture at St. Martin's <laughs> That College. was pretty much, well, I, I actually, I know it, not the whole lyric, <laughs> maybe that lyric. You did the foundation course and what happened right. after that? Yeah, so after the foundation course, then, of course, I got offered a place to do another degree. And it was going to be in photography and printmaking at Central St. Martin's. And there was a wonderful uh, teacher called Susan. I'm not going to remember her surname right now, but I'll look it up. Who was a beautiful bookmaker. And I wanted to make sculptural books. And we were going to just roll on and do that. And then I sort of looked at myself and I said, what am I doing? I can't really do another three years in education. And actually, my boyfriend at the time's dad rang me up. And he said, you can't sponge off of my son forever. <laughs> um, get a job. Um, so Did the thought, boyfriend know about this call? Yeah, no, I, I mean, he didn't mind, but it, it was just a general feeling that I ought to perhaps, you know, earn some money at some point. So I thought, well, I better do something somewhat more directed towards making money. And I thought, I better not do another three-year degree. People kept saying to me, literally at five different, completely unrelated people said, you really should do theatre design. And actually, although, you know, I went to see quite a lot of very visual pieces like Pina Bausch or Robert Lepage or, or Robert Wilson, the actual straight out theatre theatre, I didn't go to too much. Just uh, the text on its own with a sort of box scenery environment didn't excite me as much. And actually, when we had done the theatre design module during the foundation course, although it was very well taught by a wonderful teacher called Michael Vale, it didn't make me think, oh, yes, this is for me. So I hadn't really been drawn to it diagnostically through that diagnostic uh, foundation course process. But people kept saying, why don't you check out this little course called Motley Theatre Design Course? which was a one-year course only taught by people who already practiced. So I went round, walked in, and they had this little grotty studio round the back of Miss Saigon in the back of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. And it was full of old pot noodles and mice and feral, ten feral 
students there all night and I just thought oh this, this feels good everyone was making little models and reading books and every night at 10 p.m you could hear the helicopter lift up in Miss Saigon the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical next door the thing that clinched it for me was that that studio was open 24 hours and by then whatever I was doing I was doing it 24 hours a day so the idea of going to do a degree at St Martin's where you had to be out of the place at six I thought, I can't really work like that. I need a studio 24 hours a day. And I thought, well, if the theatre design thing doesn't work out, I'll just use that studio space. And you found a love for designing for the theatre. You already had a love for theatre itself, but how did it come about that you became a theatre Yeah, I just, I mean, I just got locked into uh, the rhythm of a practice. I found an architecture for my particular sort of rambling trains of thought to lock into. There was a, a system through that course. We designed six pieces and the final piece was put on at a Rose Bruford College. So I put one on. And then the very end of that course was a competition called the Limbury Prize for Stage Design. And the prize in that competition was to put a show on at the Bolton Octagon. So the prize for the Limbury Prize for Stage Design was to design a show at the Octagon Theatre in Bolton. In a way, what I'm trying to say is I didn't have a chance to look down. I was rattling through this course and having given quite a lot of consideration and pondering what might I do what would be the best thing to do I was too busy to think about it I just got on with it and I think that's true for a lot of people at that point in their life you just need to step on one tread and then just keep plodding forwards in a direction and find some development so that's what I did and I ended up designing this show in Bolton and realizing I could do it and then after that people asked me to do other ones and you talked about your upbringing on the South Coast being feral and you talked about how you, you loved this studio next, to, next door to Miss Saigon because of the sort of, it was open 24 hours and this sense of freedom and you used the word feral again. How did you then find a, a discipline to work? Because it could have been you were such a wild child and <laughs> that you could never have developed the discipline of being able to deliver. How did that happen? Did it come naturally to you? I may have misrepresented the wildness of my childness because although, you know, we were running around the place, also my mum was a teacher, right? And my dad was a journalist in education. They were education obsessives. We were very diligent at school. We were real workers. You know, we studied for all our exams. We got all our A's and B's. We, by the time we'd hit end of school, we had a really solid work ethic. So knuckling down and working wasn't a problem. I just needed to find a direction to sort of run that Duracell battery. So you knew what a deadline was then? Yeah, deadlines I wasn't so brilliant at, but um, working hard I was. So tell us how your career took off then. Well, I did that first piece and then because I was, you know, excited and enthusiastic, I wrote letters to a lot of directors and said, you know, I'd love you to come and see my play. I did a little play at the Bush Theatre and I was audacious enough to write a letter to Trevor Nunn, who at that point was running the National Theatre. I said, dear Trevor Nunn, please come and see my little play. And he did. And he then asked me to do a play at the National Theatre, Harold Pinter piece, Betrayal, on the big Littleton stage. And then it progressed from there, really. I went to the RSC, went to a lot of stuff at the National, the Royal Court. It was kind of, once you get going, it was pretty fluid. And how did you approach theatre design? Because I'm not someone who goes to the theatre that much, but my view of theatre design was, it wasn't that exciting. Of all the visual arts, it was not one of the ones that I would say was where things were happening, where avant-garde ideas were being experimented with and I think it's probably true to say that at that period it was slightly in the doldrums theatre design so how, but how did you approach it how did you make it different how did you make it, it exciting I didn't pay any regard to the stage direction so if it said on the play you know, this play takes place in a room with doors I didn't actually read that part I was used to studying literature and imagining directly from text into image and I made sculptures and I was in, I was heavily immersed in contemporary art so those were my influences I was sort of drawing on the contemporary art and you know the the wider art history that I had been studying so recently so I drew from that so I guess I was practicing within the framework of a theatre with the primary text by my side of a play but I was kind of practicing like a visual artist I guess. So you literally didn't stick to the script? I treated the script like a primary text for me to respond to. And I made my response to it, knowing that there would be a performance within the environment I created. So I wasn't creating a illustration or a translation of the text because the performance would do that. I was creating a kind of counterpart. I read an anecdote about the Harold Pinter play you mentioned, Betrayal. 
Tell us that, what, what he said afterwards. It's funny because the way this anecdote got reported recently was as if I was saying it was a compliment when it was an actually a complete backhanded slap. It was quite funny. Harold Pinter being the genius that he is. He wanted, basically the play, the play Betrayal is a very perfect, exquisite work of art. And the one thing it really did not need was little old me responding to it, to be honest. It would have been much happier in a white box. But at that time, this was 1998, Rachel Whiteread had just done her house um, at Bow. And that piece was so compelling at that moment, I was intoxicated with it. And actually, when Trevor Nunn asked me to do Betrayal, I said, why don't we just perform it? Why don't we just ask Rachel Whiteread if we can perform this piece at house? Because it was so much about memory. And that, to me, the, the, to me, the piece had been designed. Rachel had done it. And actually, I wrote to Rachel and I said, listen, Trevor, you know, doesn't think we can do it underneath your building, but can we bring your building into the National Theatre? And she wrote back and said, knock yourself out. So we sort of recreated chunks of her house. And in my mind, that just seemed like the right thing to do. And then we projected all over it. And, you know, it was a thing in itself. One could argue now that it, it was entirely surplus to requirement. Harold, you know, because he'd seen Betrayal done in a white box 50,000 times, he was quite happy to see the sort of Baroque version of it. But yeah, as a backhanded compliment, when he, uh, when he introduced me to Antonia, his wife, he just said, this is as she wrote the play. As a joke. Or rewrote the play. <laughs> he didn't even say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump forward then. So you'd established yourself as a theatre designer, but now if we look at the things that you do, you're involved in working with um, rock stars, pop stars, stages, opera. Um, you delve into AI. You, you, you've you done fashion and, and everything like that. How did you start to then diversify outwards, which is, is not easy to do, is it? Most most creatives, they find their niche and they, they stay in it. Yeah, and before I answer that question, I just want to say one more thing about why did I do theatre? As you rightly say, it wasn't the most glamorous. You know, you didn't look at it and go, all right, theatre's where it's at, right, at that time. I could see, I guess, that there was a structure of resources and teams and humanity available to collaborate with, to put stuff on. I liked those people. I like that tribe of people because I think now this was, you know, remember we come out of the 80s. I was a child of Thatcher most of my time. You know, we just ending decades of conservative government uh, just passing 1997. And I found a group of people who none of them were being paid. You know, this was a, a lot of people working in the theatre, working late at night, working around the clock collectively, not to express themselves but to make a collective expression and doing it basically because they wanted to do it for free. There wasn't a client. You know, if the client was anyone, it was a person who bought a ticket, but there wasn't a client. You, you made it together because it was the right thing to make. Um, I think that's why I was drawn to it. And I could see that the people were great. Yes, no one had done, people weren't doing particularly interesting things with it all the time. Um, but I could see some people were, you know, the peanut Bausch, the Rebels, and there was a lot of stuff that was great. So that's why I think I was drawn to that group of people. I think I can make something with them. But to answer your second question, your question was how did it then sort of transpire that I shifted from one medium to another? And you know what? I think it may have been luck because theatre naturally leads to opera. You know, I think people had got a little fed up with my um, overreach probably uh, in the world of text and straight drama. So I was slightly moving out of that anyway. Um, whereas people who worked in opera, especially European opera, were, were quite drawn to what I was doing. So I moved pretty much into, into doing opera design. I say it was a fluke, but it, it was a fluke that happened three times. There were three, three pop artists who all asked me to design their concerts at the same time. It was the Pet Shop Boys, uh, a singer called Mika, and Kanye West. It was all in 2005. And that for, for different reasons. Mika, because David McVicker, who's an opera director, and I were doing a, a Salome opera at the Royal Opera House and there was a South Bank show documentary about it and Mika watched it and I was very pregnant in 2008 and oh, it must have been earlier than that anyway I was, I was pregnant um 2006 and he saw me being actually kind of torn apart a design I had put together was not liked by the director and he observed how I responded and I just kind of apparently I flinched and then carried on <laughs> tore this spiral staircase out of the design and just carried on. And Mika, he's a sensitive guy and he picked up on that. He said, I want her to work with me. Alex Poots used to run a festival called Only Connect at the Barbican Centre. And he put on this festival and his whole fascination was to put unlikely collaborations together. And he thought it'd be interesting if I would collaborate with 
a post-punk band called Wire. And he asked me to do it, but I didn't respond. It was the early days of email. I didn't respond. So he then asked the Chapman brothers to do it. Then I did see the email. I did respond. He said, well, can I have both? So I did the second half of this show and the Chapman brothers did the first half. And that was in 2003. So he has to be credited really with that first transference to, to pop music. And then you said about so these three musicians, these three bands got in touch and mm. did you work with all of them then? Yeah, I worked with, I, worked, I was excited to do that. You know, I was really excited to, I mean, although I'd been to a lot of small gigs, I hadn't really spent much time in a stadium or in an arena. So pretty much my first experience was when working in there. It's quite a sensation being around 100,000 people roaring. It must have been quite a culture shock as well because you talked about what you liked about the theatre was this culture of people, this dedication to the cause, you know, people working for no money, probably taking quite a long time to put things together, get the funding and, and everything and the rehearsals, and then rock and roll, which is fast, big bucks, international people getting on and off planes. So how did you cope with that transition? I, I rather enjoyed it. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, I think actually there was the epitome of this. It must have been around 2006 where I found myself at the sort of junction of these various fields I was working in and I was in Miami rehearsing for Kanye's Touch the Sky tour but I had also committed to being at a meeting in Spain about a production I was doing with an Australian director at Hamburg we were doing a Benjamin Britten opera Midsummer Night's Dream and I had committed to being in Manchester doing a, a new play called All the Ordinary Angels and I'd sort of managed to mess it up so that these things all had to happen on the same day so I found myself flying from Miami to Manchester, just to go to a little meeting. And having been so fast, like this, 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 we're doing this, we're building this, we're making this, we're filming this in, in Miami for the Kanye show. I then sat in this rather quiet room in Manchester where the only really question that came up for me as the set designer was, did I like this prop teacup? Was it the right one? And I said, yes. And then I <laughs> got in a, some kind of transport to Liverpool to fly to Spain to sit in a quiet rural a house to talk about Benjamin Britten for a week, you know? So so you're absolutely right. It was um, a clash of timescales and rhythms. But you're still juggling those different worlds, mm-hmm. aren't you? Mm-hmm. And then some more as well, including you've now started to become an artist in your own right rather than just working for other people. So why don't you talk about that transition as well? Really, I have to credit that to Louis Vuitton. I was invited in 2014 to work with Nicolas Jeskier on his runway shows. He had you know, already done one, but this was his second, the Fondation Louis Vuitton, the beautiful Frank Gehry building had just been built. And we were to make the first show there. I'd ne- I hadn't been to a fashion show. I didn't know anything about how to do them, which is just how I like it really. Cause I think my mind, and I think many people's minds are much more agile when you're an outsider and we don't know the rules and you're somewhat wrong footed at every point and you need to keep doing that to yourself anyway. So we, began making shows and at a certain point they wanted to make an exhibition, you know, knowing that not that many people can visit the fashion show. How do you communicate the clothes to the public? So at 180 The Strand, before it sort of became what it is now in London, we took over that 22,000 square foot and tried to turn the fashion catwalk show inside out so that it was the audience who were walking and the show communicated itself to you as you walked through. Now, this to me was an utter treat of a canvas, a perambulatory, you know, promenade piece of theatre communicating an artist's train of thought, in this case, uh, Nicola Jerskia's train of thought. So having just come out of doing that, when I got an email from ID magazine saying, you know, I couldn't quite understand the email, I, th- I misread it. And I thought they said, would you like to make an installation of 12,000 square foot in a warehouse in Peckham of your own? And when I actually look back at that email, I honestly, I did re-scrutinise it not that long ago. It didn't, it actually said, can you make us a three minute perfume advert? I just didn't want it to, I wanted it, to, <laughs> I read into it what I wanted it to say. So because I had this in my mind, I went straight on from the Louis Vuitton series three piece into making it this mirror maze installation, which was just me doing, you know, what came as naturally the next step. And it was um, a short film that I made, a short meditation on architecture, geometry, and identity. But because I've had a long anxiety about filmmaking, it's something I always kind of feel I should one day do, but haven't got around to yet. I often put forward a little critique of films. When I sit in the cinema, I go, God, that was good, but what could have made it better? And often I reach the conclusion that the film would have been better if it had a hole in it. 
so you could walk through the hole and enter something sculptural rather than just watching the effect of the light that creates the sculptural illusion. So I fulfilled that ambition and made a film with a hole. So you came in, you watched a two and a half minute film with a hole in it, an oval hole. And then at the end of the film, you walked through the hole and you were in the environment that you'd seen being created in the film, which was this large scale mirror maze. And then finally, you found yourself in a scent that uh, Chanel made specifically just for five days that we called Chanel SE15. And so, yeah, that was the first piece and it, and it worked well. So you did both then. You did a three minute commercial and you filled this big space as well. So you managed to keep everyone happy. Well, I mean, this is a larger point of, um, you know, the, the opportunities and the resources that are available within uh, the communication of a market, right? And there's no reason why one can't slightly hijack those resources and use them in uh, pursuit of one's own mythology, right? Which is what I did. And tell us about how you work. I remember coming here 18 months ago or something like that. Yeah. And you were working with Katy Perry at the time. And um, I was really astonished to see that she would be sending you an email. You'd print out the email, draw some sketches on it, get your assistant to scan it and send it back. Is that is that typical? Yeah, sketching, actually. I, I, I you know, and, and whichever field it's in, um, it's always just whatever piece of paper and a pencil I can sketch. And often I, I will do a scale drawing, but I often don't have a ruler. I want to scale the drawing to the piece of paper. So I tear off the edge of the piece of paper and I just draw some pretty even looking lines and say, well, those will be meters for this drawing and sort of organically make my own scale drawing like that. I don't really use a computer or ruler. I just draw it like that. And how do you work with someone like Kanye then, someone who's like a genius in his own right and probably has very strong ideas? How do you, what happens when your brain meets Kanye's brain? How does that process work? Well, I haven't worked with Kanye for a while. I last worked with Kanye in 2013. So I'm not working with him at the moment. He's doing extraordinary, brilliant things. But yeah, any of those artists who are, you know, in my opinion, quite bionic people, um, you know, in, in that Malcolm Gladwell blink definition of someone who's done something for 10,000 hours. They've all done stuff for at least 200,000 hours, I would say, forget 10. And I guess artists like that work with people like me in that they they know what my framework's going to be. They, so they sort of want, I think Kanye once said, he said, I just want, he had a lot of people in the room. He had some, Vanessa Beecroft, John Maguire, myself, Virgil Abloh. And he just said, I want to hear the Virgil of it, the John of it, the Vanessa of it, the Ez of it. You know, so often those people, are, they know exactly which segment you're going to bring to their train of thought. And is that a, a community similar to the community you like so much in in theatre? Oh, my goodness, it can be. I mean, even just now doing the, um, you know, it's November is award season in rock and roll. So, you know, it's a moment for a lot of artists to create small sketches, incredibly well resourced small sketches so it'll be a three minute performance on the MTV awards or something and it can go for nothing or it can be an exquisite little short film that a group of people you know those people at MTV I've actually been working with them for the past 10 years um, and I know them all I've seen them their children grow up we're friends and we have often a two-hour rehearsal segment the budget can be up to a million pounds or more and you're spending that pretty much in two hours with the decisions that you make. That will go there. This light will come on. This will be yellow. She will stand here. This camera shot will be static. No, it won't. It's going to be, no, it's going to be static. Those decisions are made like that. Only this little huddle of people who know each other, who trust each other, and will just, you know, take and execute at speed to make that the right thing that it needs to be. It's a very tight set of parameters that particular one to work in it's the opposite of a sort of luxurious sprawling you know round the table conversational theater process but equally when you make a piece of theater a lot of you know the final work comes down to decisions that were made in quite tight stretches of time in a technical rehearsal as well and we were talking at the beginning about your studio downstairs and all the, the shelves of all the models of the opera sets and the theater sets which probably handmade at scale over a period of time but with some of these faster TV-based things, is is the is your scribble on the torn-off piece of paper? Is that it? Is that your input that's then sent off and turned uh, often, into? Often, I mean, no, because everything has to go through the studio. And 
I mean, something I didn't mention earlier, which I should mention, is when I talk about theatre and, and how these things come about, it's endless conversation with collaborators. You know, I have these ongoing trains of thought conversations with theatre directors, you know, Lindsay Turner, Sam Mendes, Casper Holton in opera. Those are ongoing conversations that get translated into work as well. None of this happens out of my little head on, on its own at all. And equally, my little sketch goes into those amazing a uh, group of women and men downstairs who translate it into a buildable thing. You can't build off my sketch, it's meaningless. It all gets translated into beautiful 3D models and they they give their lives to it. You know, these people downstairs, they are working around the clock. They are missing their boyfriends and girlfriends. They're missing anniversaries and dinners. They are dedicated. They're extraordinary people. And you talk about a lot of decisions being made on the fly, but if someone asks you to come up with, uh, gives you a brief or asks to collaborate with you, do you go for a walk to come up with ideas? Do you lock yourself in the in a dark room or, or do I just, just flood your head at all times? Often it's an ongoing part of a conversation and th there's a few conversations all going on at once. So there's conversations directly with these musicians and these artists. There's conversations with theatre directors and opera directors, like some of that I've mentioned. And then there's the conversation with the eight people in my studio. So generally, yes, there's a thing where I do wake up in the morning and usually something's there for me, <laughs> but it, it's the beginning or it's a fragment. And I take that into a room full of people and it's never alone. It's always with a group and it's always conversational. We we'll just say, well, what if it's this and what if it's that? In the case of, um, you know, musicians, they often have an extraordinary series of people already around them who they've been talking to for five years so I want to pick up on that depth of engagement. I don't want to just turn up and, and start from scratch, you know. And of course, now you're working at an architectural scale as well. You're, you're commissioned to design the British Pavilion at Dubai Expo 2020. So tell us about that jump of scale. And, and If you think about the first great exhibition in 1851, and you think about this country that we live in, and the impact that a small island has had, pretty much igniting the Industrial Revolution, which led to so much progress... And we now find ourselves in this calamity of where the Industrial Revolution has led us from a climate point of view. Uh, isn't it incumbent upon us, this little small island, to now be broadcasting uh, from this building, which, by the way, is designed, <laughs> it, it is designed a bit like a musical instrument. It is there to broadcast. Shouldn't we now be broadcasting ways in which we can try and unravel and unpick this calamity? Listen, the expo's in Dubai. The site that we will be building on is sponsored by Saudi Aramco. Um, it's incumbent upon us, the UK, who has been the first country to de declare a climate emergency. We're the first of the G7 countries to commit to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We have to put all our effort in that particular realm to broadcast and celebrate and explore and examine ways to communicate that. So tell us quickly what the pavilion will be then. It's a giant musical instrument, sort of like a conch, a big, uh, conical shape, extruded uh, cross-laminated timber. On its facade, big circular facade, concealed LED illuminates uh, and communicates a collective poem. And the collective poem is achieved by each visitor contributing a single word which then passes through an algorithm. And on the front of the building, the collective text is broadcast, ever-changing. And, and that's one of your um, ongoing experiments with using AI, isn't it, to generate poetry and so on and so forth and crowd sampling and things like that? Yeah, it came about because in 2016, Hans Ulrich Oberst and Jana Peel at the Serpentine Gallery invited me to make some kind of work to celebrate their annual gala. And I wanted to make a piece that could gather that 1,500 people into a single work. And so with Google Arts and Culture, they already had an algorithm Ross Goodwin had created. And we pushed that forward and made this collective poetry algorithm. So I've been working with it. I then, as a sort of bre anti-Brexit comment, took it to Trafalgar Square and painted one of the lions red um, and got one of the lions to uh, make a collective poem again that anyone could contribute a word to. Um, so this is, yeah, an, a sort of progression of that work. Some people think that artificial intelligence is going to take over and 
even take over what creative people like you do? Do you have a view on that? I know that my ability to predict is poor in that I was given the first camera phone in 2003 by Nokia, the Nokia 7350, and asked to predict how it would change us as a species. And I was absolutely unvisionary and just said, oh, yes, it's not a very good camera. Um, so I don't have much faith in my ability to predict what AI will do, but I do recommend anyone who wants to delve into that to read the wonderful Max Tegmark book, Life 3.0. Which talks about a future in which AI plays a prominent role in everything we That's do. That's right. It hypothesises about the possibilities of a benevolent general AI. Uh, what would happen if the AI could predict um, conflicts before they arose and could influence those on each side of the conflict in such a way that the conflict never happened? And back briefly to the British Pavilion in Dubai. I think you're the first woman to ever be given that commission. Do you see yourself a woman creative or are you just a creative? Listen, I only know the experience that I've lived. It'd be really interesting <laughs> to have a go at uh, uh, the other version of life, uh, maybe as a tiger or as a, or as a mouse or as a, or as a man. I only know the female version. But yeah, sometimes one... Fi- I mean, I find myself often in rooms where I'm the only woman. But uh, that's the only way I know it to have been. And do you see yourself as an active role model or a pioneer for greater diversity and equality in, in, in the industry? If you're a woman, you decide to have children, then you are faced every day with the choice of going out and doing your absolute best you can in a project or being the best mother you can. But I do think that challenge is also faced by men. My husband feels as uh, conflicted as a father. So I don't think that conflict is, is restricted only to women. But hopefully I set an example of trying to find a balance and be content with you know, equally failing as a mother and failing as an artist on a day by day, carefully calibrated uh, basis. And you can see from being in your home that you do, you have achieved some kind of balance because your studio is here, your husband's studio is here, your family is here. That's about precise, uh, using precise little what I call shoulder moments of time. The moment when I'm on the way out, the moment when I'm on the way in, those can become moments of spending valuable time with the family, with the children which if my studio was elsewhere, those moments would be taken uh, to get there and back. And also, by the way, it's another trying to limit the carbon footprint of what we do. You know, there's eight people working in here and we all eat together. We eat vegetarian food, we eat around the table, we use one cooker, we use one kitchen and we're using one electricity bill. You know, it's uh, we're just trying to keep it as lean and mean as we can, really. And just now we were talking about how you've now started to do projects under your own name in your own right. Do you have a a plan for the future? Are you going to carry on working in all these different areas or even expand that or? This reminds me of a conversation that I had when I was at, you know, secondary school and I was probably about 16. And the teacher, career advice said, do you have a plan? Are you going to focus? Are you just going to be a jack of all trades forever? Um, And here we are 40 years later, 30 years later. I am a bit greedy. It turns out, and I really enjoy like the memory palace piece that we've just made at Pitsanger has, you know, been the sort of next natural progression in that train of thought. So it's um, a large scale installation. It's not associated with anyone who was trying to make an advert. It is bona fide in an art gallery because it wants to be there because someone commissioned it at the art gallery at Pitsanger Manor in Ealing, which is a most stunning uh, house. It, w- it was John Soane's country house, and it's absolutely breathtaking. Um, and they've given over uh, one area of it to be a gallery, and they're rather visionary. They had Anish Kapoor do their inaugural exhibition and have invited me to do the next one, and the, and the one following me is also going to be really interesting. And that was an absolute gift, really, because it was... The brief was do whatever you want, whatever you want. Have this, you know, 60 foot wide space, do whatever you want. And I I knew that I wanted to make uh, an imaginary map, a sort of gathering together of all the threads of things I'd been thinking about. So it's a map of shifts in human perspective over the past 73,000 years. Not least because I find myself at the moment really concerned with how, as a species, we're going to, and I know you're concerned with this too, how are we going to make the shift in perspective and the change of attitude and the change of habit that we know we need to make? Um, And I feel this sense of uh, all the, perhaps all the work I've been doing, Marcus, perhaps 
all of this learning how to work with audiences, all of this learning how to use flashing lights and quiet sounds and loud sounds and quiet colours and bright colours. Maybe it's just been a sort of <laughs> training to try to learn to say the thing that really needs to be said, which is how are we going to, you know, protect our species and our biosphere from extinction? Not in a preachy way, but just uh, that I, I, I'm rather influenced by Timothy Morton's writing and his manifesto to artists when he says, please don't preach, just amaze us into changing our mind. Um, and I guess that's that's where a lot of my energy is, is going at the moment. And right back at the beginning of this conversation when I mentioned your... Again, your room full of models mm. and the ephemerality of a lot of your work, you immediately responded to say, but I, I realise I have a huge carbon footprint, so this is clearly playing on your mind. Massively. Yeah, I mean, I, I've just read a book which I can't recommend highly enough called Are We Human? Um, by Mark w Wigley and Beatrice, I'm going to have to tell you her surname. Colomina. Colomina, there you go. Oh my goodness, it was, uh, it's a breathtaking book um, about the feedback loops between objects and humans. We design a flint, our hand now becomes a different kind of prosthesis. We design a mobile phone, you know, that redesigns us. You design an object, the object redesigns us. And it, it draws our attention to the webs of networks that we're caught in. And I kind of uh, am beginning to reach a sort of train of thought which suggests that I actually don't mind being caught up in a big web of interconnections, you know. I love the fact that I can draw on the shared intelligence, the collective intelligence of so many people on the planet. I am delighted to be able to find the collective richness of connected minds there. What I'm less interested in being drawn into is a shop at every point. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the webs that we're weaving around ourselves. I think the trouble is that they're getting polluted and infected with market. And I do think wh where I'm looking at now is how can we, like a sort of messy old tangle, that when you pick up an old piece of string and it's all tangled up, how can we just unpick and keep the beautiful geometric web of connections between us, but sort of know where to cauterize the ones that are really just shopping. And you make it sound like this is a, a, a process of becoming aware that you're still going through, but have you settled on a view of, of what you can do about this? At the moment, I think it's a lot of small things, you know, really basic things, Marcus, like, you know, making sure that my energy supplier is only renewable energy, trying to divest my banking from a bank that is heavily invested in fossil fuels will be this afternoon's mission. The word offset I find unhelpful because it suggests that one can, but at least balance each flight I take with some trees that I'm planting in Sebastião Salgado's reforestation project and trying to tread lightly. There was a beautiful thing that George Monbiot said recently when he said, listen, I'm going to be accused of being a hypocrite. But he said, I actually think if we trouble ourselves with that, if all of us who are absolutely tangled in the system that we want to question, if we're not allowed to question it, then who the hell can? If we're only going to be called a hypocrite. He said, so I've decided that there's no option of moral purity. So it isn't really a question of do you want to be a hypocrite or morally pure because there's no real option to be morally pure. So it's really a question of do you want to be a hypocrite or do you want to be a cynic? And I'd rather be a hypocrite than a cynic. So um, yeah, it, it's stepping lightly. My, my life takes me into places that are using massive amounts of resources. But I do small, I mean, I do ridiculous small things like if I'm on a plane, I say, I don't want that. Don't give me that. If I'm on a if I'm in a hotel, I use one towel, hang it up, don't wash my other towel. It's stupid little things. Um, I go rapidly around the house turning off lights. It's, you know, it seems crazy, but I think you just have to. And, and I think the most useful thing I can do probably is use the skills I've learned of, of storytelling and communication to try to find those patterns, to try to find the patterns of connection. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. You know that Body Worlds exhibition? And you see just the arterial system devoid of anything else. And you look at it and just as a visual person, you go, well, I'm obviously related to a tree. And then you read the James Gleick book, Chaos, which explains to you that the equation that governs the division at every point of division of an artery is the same equation that governs the division of the branches of a tree, which, by the way, is the same equation that governs the way rain falls down your windscreen or the way that sheep uh, arrange themselves randomly on, on a hill. So if we can perhaps recognise that a bit more 
and feel that connection between us and the rest of, you know, living and non-living beings. Perhaps we'll, you know, feel less, uh, more able to consider ourselves worthy of not going extinct, if you see what I mean. And a final question then, just now you said, the thing is with me is I'm greedy, but I don't think you meant materially greedy or financially greedy. Is it, is it greedy <laughs> to experience everything? Is it greedy to be the centre of this network or is it a kind of greed to, to be the one that, that finds the solution? What did you mean by that? Uh, may, maybe, maybe greed was the wrong word. Um, I think my curiosity is quite insatiable. I like the word curiosity because I found when looking up its etymology that it comes from the same root as to care. Kura means to care. So care, curate, curious, they all come from the same root. And I do think profound curiosity is profound caring. And I think mine is endless. So it's not that you're greedy, it's that you care. I hope so. Mm. Curious. I think that's a good point to end on. Thanks so much, Ez. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This podcast was sponsored by Twin Motion and produced by our in-house creative team, Dazeen Studio, with music by Yuri Suzuki from Pentagram. To find out more, go to dazeen.com forward slash podcasts. You can keep up to date on past and future episodes of Face to Face by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify.